here we go i just pop in again and yeah i think we had a great session and i don't see any of the questions popping out in the chat box i think everyone is clear about the session uh like they have just got every answer from this presentation slide so yeah thanks everyone for attending this session out so let's get started uh yeah hello everyone and yeah welcome to the dev conference again we would be having a session right now over the selenium docker grid on the openshift 4 platform which would be taken over by our uh, red hat speakers jatan malde and deepak call here who would be joining in the session and if you have any of the questions you can just drop off in the chat box meanwhile the session goes on so let's get started Hello everyone, my name is Deepak. Uh, I am a quality engineering manager in Red Hat. And uh, with me is Jatan. Good morning friends, my name is Jatan and I've been at Red Hat uh, as technical support engineer for OpenShift. Been working uh, OpenShift for a long time. So today we are going to talk about uh, scaling uh, the uh, a Selenium grid. So Deepak will take over uh, uh, the, the details around the Selenium. So over to you Deepak. Thank you, Jatan. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, let's start with what actually is Selenium Test because uh, this is DevConf and I'm sure there are people who are not from the uh, testing background. There are people from other development, project management and other backgrounds. So to give to give everyone a brief introduction of uh, what exactly is the selenium test uh, so selenium is an open source tool uh, which uses json wire protocol to uh, help modify the dom inside a browser so there is a selenium server and then there is the native browser selenium client libraries which actually implement those uh, methods so what you can do is you can write your tests in uh, in one of the uh, five or six languages which Selenium supports, and then you can uh, run your tests by opening the browsers in uh, a Selenium server, a virtual machine, or anywhere, and then you can run your end-to-end -end tests. So uh, right now, Selenium supports them. Um, multitude of browsers like Chrome, Firefox, Safari, uh, Internet Explorer, Edge as well, and then Opera. And it used to support uh, HTTP unit as well, but I don't think it, it is supported right now. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the, uh, the, th the problems with uh, running Selenium tests have always been the conflict between the browser version as well as the selenium version so uh, as you all know it's an open source project so the speed at which the browser vendors increase the uh, development of browsers does not necessarily match with the speed with which uh, the selenium team uh, develops their selenium version so there is always this mismatch uh, between the selenium version and uh, the browser versions plus the uh, plus different uh, different set of test engineers use different kind of selenium infrastructure for example uh, i i've seen most of the test engineers actually going ahead and running the selenium tests on their local host uh, which obviously is not scalable which is uh, which is not uh, and you cannot put uh, those tests in your CI systems. The second problem is uh, uh, using VMs, because uh, if you aim to do the cross-browser testing, uh, like you want to include Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer as well, then uh, you probably need to have VM set up for Selenium servers where you can then uh, point your tests to multiple simultaneous browsers like Chrome, Firefox, and IE, and run those tests on those VMs. But again, VMs uh, also have their share of problems, like they are not extremely scalable and prone to same old uh, browser and uh, Selenium version issues. 
all, all of this all of this uh, changed drastically when uh, the selenium project decided to build the selenium containers for each of the browser library as well as the selenium server uh, so i think around uh, 3 to 4 years ago people started using selenium docker containers which were uh, which were very fast uh, scalable and they used to just get rid of uh, your uh, browser and selenium compatibility issues but as uh, as you all know the problem with containers is that they are actually actually disposable entities you cannot you cannot build a, a high availability selenium cloud infrastructure with uh, just docker containers so plus you never know the state of the container whether it is up or not and everything around that and that is where the uh, container orchestration platforms like kubernetes come into picture and uh, this presentation is more about how you can build a sustainable scalable and high availability selenium infrastructure using uh, using selenium docker images and uh, okd next slide please all right so i'll hand over to uh, the expert in this field uh, and then uh, he'll talk about uh, everything from kubernetes okd and how how to build this setup and then i'll probably take over in the end and uh, i'll show you how i can run my tests and point my tests to this uh, uh, private selenium cloud over to you jatan thank you thank you so much deepak um, i think by now we have seen uh, what are those uh, basic pinpoints while using uh, selenium uh, and its legacy formats. Uh, moving to containers, uh, one of the most important uh, help which a uh, testing or a QA team gets is uh, the environment which they require to run multiple tests in multiple formats is, is uh, has become more easier with containers. But uh, just having container doesn't help because if that container goes down and uh, if you want to bring it back up, uh, you just have to rerun it using the container runtime but uh, in the in, in in that time there are some cis which which definitely get uh, failed just because there is no availability of your browser or any kind of your tools which is required to run those tests so in that case you just not require a container runtime but you definitely require a orchestrated tool that is exactly where uh, we have uh, kubernetes since uh, kubernetes has been one of the best orchestrating tool and has proven a lot in uh, in scaling workloads, making them more easier uh, using containers and using the different features which is provided. So what's exactly a Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is a declarative language for launching containers. What's a declarative language? So that means uh, I, I just have um, uh, an ability to make sure that even when I'm not around my machines, my containers or my environment is always up and running. So when I say environment, I mean those test uh, infras which are required to run my test. So let's say if I am an I am a developer and my concern is that my test should run no matter uh, the if if there is no one from the infra team or any other team available. So uh, I should not be dependent, and in that case, I just have to run the test to make sure that uh, my uh, my objectives are completed. So in that case, uh, this orchestrator tool makes sure that uh, he gives you those environment uh, specific containers uh, so that you can run the test and even if due to some reason to, those containers goes down like uh, for example if the underlying machines are uh, very highly used and are um, and and they and there is a memory spike to it so it doesn't mean that your tests will fail because the orchestrator tool will make sure that uh, the containers which were running on that machine goes to some other node from the same cluster so that uh, the developer doesn't feel that the environment is not accessible. So this was a highly collaborative open source project uh, 
and now it's uh, been uh, also worked in open source to make sure that uh, more and more ability of this orchestrator tool can be taken and uh, we make the best out of it. So Red Hat is the second largest contributing member with many ideas coming from the, uh, it, it's like it's, it, it's been a very good to have them um, coming from the open source enthusiast and they're trying to make it more and more better if day after day. So why do we call it as K8S? So there is a there is some acronym behind it. It's like, so between K and S, there are eight letters which definitely makes it Kubernetes. That is exactly why we call it as Kube or K8S as a short form. It, it allows you to start, stop, update, manage clusters, running the containers and many more things. So we'll come to that. We'll see how this, uh, OKD, which is one of the flavor of uh, Kubernetes and built over Kubernetes, uh, does this help? Does help a developer to get his tests running uh, easily? So, uh, so additional functionalities to make containers easier to use in a cluster. Yeah. So it, as I said, it's it's easy to reach. Just a login to one of the uh, URL and you get an access to an environment, an entire environment which is uh, self-sustainable to make sure that whatever you ask for is available at the, at the other end. Kubernetes does not and will not expose all the features of Docker command line. Yeah, so it's not that the Kubernetes uh, is dependent on some other uh, tool, but it definitely requires a dinner runtime time at the backend because whatever the uh, Kubernetes is or whatever is orchestrated tool meant to run, it requires someone at the backend to run them. And that is exactly where the container runtime comes in the picture because uh, your containers are definitely going to be managed by the runtime. And over the runtime, we have different components of Kubernetes who will make sure that whatever is running stays in the running mode. Whatever goes down, the exact desired number of those uh, containers come back up in some other nodes as well. So there are some primitive keywords for Kubernetes like masters, nodes, pod, replication controller. So what exactly is a master? This is the uh, this is that uh, component of Kubernetes which runs the control plane. In this control plane, you have an API server, a server which or an API server which looks for requests. When you run some kubectl commands, when you run OC commands, this is the API server which makes sure that uh, these requests are being addressed. While we have controller and uh, the scheduler along with etcd, which makes sure that uh, the desired number of state, whatever is asked for, is always kept in the uh, live in the in, in the current format. So that's exactly what a controller is. And at the end, uh, if you want to run or scale up more uh, uh, events or, or more containers, you need someone who will schedule them. So it's it's like that is exactly where the scheduler comes into picture with you can automatically scale through different components like autoscaler to run more workloads as and when the request goes on increasing. But at the end of the day, all of this should be stored somewhere in, in, uh, in a manner that they can be received, received and updated as and when required. So that is exactly where your HCD is used, where you store and store all of your data and make sure that whatever is required and whatever is meant to change is also Okay. Then comes your node. These are your workloads, or let's say as minions, which make sure that whatever is the workloads, uh, these workloads are managed as per the resources available on the node. A node runs a kubelet along with it, which makes sure that uh, the, the respective node is in healthy state, is giving its responses to the master. And if the node is out of service, like if the node goes uh, high in memory or out of disk, we uh, have an ability or the orchestrator tool has an ability to even notify the same. That way the node will not accept more workloads and the kubelet running on the node will tell that this node is already pretty full. Uh, I'm trying to dra drain this out and take out all the containers of this and then schedule it on the other nodes. Then comes what pod. So pod is just a collection of one or more containers. So Containers are uh, processes which uh, which are mainly uh, managed by your container runtime, and a collection of these containers can be pods. Well, you can even run one container in one pod, and you can run more than one containers also in one pod. Then comes your replication 
controller this controller makes sure that a number of um, the desired number of replicas for any of the application whatever has been mentioned in the declarative object for example the uh, deployment config or deployment is always met if that means that let's say if you make sure that you want uh, two replicas always to accept 20 requests considering 10 is been 10 requests are being handled by uh, one application in that case uh, there would be two ports by default when you deploy them and let's say if one of the node having the pod goes down this uh, can this replication controller uh, will be monitoring the state of the um, will be monitoring the state of this project and uh, also will be monitoring the number of replicas which are expected to be up and running in this application and that is where when it sees that there is no uh, there is there is one uh, container less or one pod less it notifies the same then the api server with the help of the kubelet running on the node makes sure that the another container is also up and running well, you have the pods, you have the containers, but how do I access them? How do I make sure that there's a load uh, being uh, shared between two? Because I cannot tell that, okay, go to this node and share it with this pod. And uh, if you want to move it to this one, move, go to pod B. So in that case, you need a service, which is this, this entity is a virtual uh, entity in uh, uh, Kubernetes or in OKD, where uh, this service manages the underlying uh, pods and whatever traffic which is expected to be as an internal traffic or communication between two services running on the Kubernetes is being done through this services or this uh, layer which we call as SVC. So when I say that uh, SVC is also required or is, is used for um, com internal communication, but how will a service know that these are his endpoint or these are the three endpoints which the uh, which the traffic is meant to go or or where the traffic should be going when it's an incoming or outgoing packet so at that time a service uh, uh, is dependent on objects like labels so labels play a very important role in kubernetes where uh, the discovery a service discovery is been done uh, through labels so whatever selectors you write in the service the same selectors will be looked in every pod to make sure that uh, if those match then the service uh, enables this pod as one of its endpoint and then even send the packets or even send the incoming traffic to the end application which is a pod running inside of it or running as a container and all of this is packed in one namespace that is exactly where you have that isolation uh, part of making sure that more than one developer can use the platform and even they can keep the data um, isolated to make sure that we do not leak or we do not have any security breaches between projects because um, having one namespace running some application and only allowing one user at a time is not what our orchestrated tool is meant for we want to make sure that multiple applications or multiple end developers are able to access the platform make use of the platform the resources the platform is providing and then run their workloads so coming to okd uh, in specific, as we mentioned as our title of the session, as um, running a Selenium grid on uh, OKD4. So what exactly is OKD or what exactly is OKD4? So OKD is an origin community distribution of Kubernetes. It's optimized for continuous application development and multi-tenant deployment. So when I say multi-tenant deployment is making sure that no project uh, details are shared or accessed by some other project. Uh, in a normal deployment. OKD adds developer and operational centric tools on top of Kubernetes to enable the rapid application deployment, development, easy development and scaling for a long-term lifecycle maintenance. So if you see in the right-hand side of my um, uh, presentation, you can see this is a developer mode where um, the developer directly comes uh, on the platform and tries deploying his application as in when he wants to and he doesn't have to make sure that he requires an administrative access whatever access he has is what he can use and deploy his application in his selective namespace he can monitor them he can search for some specific labels or some specific objects using labels and even he can build using different strategies we also have some more projects or some more uh, objects like um, config map and secret through which sensitive data could be shared with the application. 
like username and passwords which could be embedded in secret and shared to the uh, application making sure that um, these are not exposed when the application is talking to other services inside OpenShift or OKD. So OKD is also referred as origin in GitHub and in the documentation. So it was previously called as origin, but then uh, it was rebranded to BS OKD and that is exactly what we call it now. So in, uh, previously we had OKD3, which had a 1.11 version of Kubernetes. While now we move to OKD4, where uh, the current deployment is uh, 1.18 for what uh, for the latest OKD4 uh, you are going to see in this presentation. OKD makes launching Kubernetes on any cloud or bare metals uh, more easier. It, it, it's, it's simple to install and uh, you will see how fast it gets installed. Uh, definitely, we are not going to play a, a video of installation because, because it just take half an hour uh, to get installed. But that's even more and more interesting when you see the next slide. So how do you uh, install it? So in order to install, you need the right set of binaries, the client tools, so that you can utilize them to install the right images uh, of uh, OKD over any of your hardwares or any of your tools or resources you have at the back end. So you use the OC to library or sorry, the OC binary to download and extract the tools. You can just run this command and copy the image. This image is available at the release uh, page over here. Just click on the link and you will find a uh, uh, the latest releases. So when we developed this, we had uh, this uh, version as one of the latest versions. We copied the binary uh, to the to the directory where we wanted to start the installation from. So this is a bastion host, and on this host, uh, we want to make sure that the installation uh, uh, goes ahead. So uh, you will be prompted uh, to choose a platform to install AWS uh, to install this OpenShift. So AWS is currently the best place to start with OKD4, while uh, it already has Fedora Core OS machine images set. For other cloud providers, you can uh, move to um, you can move to other providers, but you will need to uh, set up this Fedora Core OS images on it. So uh, the machines which you which you see in OKD4, the underlying machines run uh, Core OS uh, operating system. So in this OKD4, we run Fedora Core OS, and over that we build uh, the complete Kubernetes orchestrator tool. In this, there is a temporary control plane bootstrapping where uh, a, a temporary control plane is set up, and then uh, the production um, control plane is being uh, given the access, and then the work or the installation start. So uh, to look for more uh, installation formats, you can definitely reach out to this link and look for other uh, variants of installation. You can take a look at other cloud providers. If you're looking for bare metal, even that is possible and um, it, it becomes more and more easier. So this is a short snip of how the installation is done. Uh, I have uh, tried to copy uh, the complete uh, steps in this um, in this snip, so that you understand what exactly gets installed and where it's getting installed. So this uh, is the binary I pulled from the um, release uh, play page, and uh, when I check the version, I see this is OpenShift 4.5, and this is the build, uh, and this is the release image which gets uh, which is actually getting installed. So the moment I uh, have this binary and I have my cloud uh, uh, credentials configured at the back end, so consider that I've been uh, deploying this on AWS. I have configured my AWS uh, secrets, that's access key and the secret before the installation has started uh, or before starting the installation to make sure that whatever or whenever I start the installation, there is no uh, there is no issue with getting this. Um, uh, um, OKD4 cluster up and running. So, um, so, so uh, let's say that you have AWS environment uh, uh, or, or AWS credentials configured on the Bastion machine, and now you can run the command OpenShift install create cluster with increased log level to take a look at what exactly you see uh, or or to see what exactly is getting installed. So once this is hit, uh, the install config or there is a YAML file which is fed uh, which is fed to the installer. 
we we run terraform in the back end to create machines with uh, when it's a cloud provider installation and that machines require some basic details which are configured in the install config once this install config is fetched it tries and applies create different resources on the aws it it creates your iam roles it creates your machines it creates the bootstrap node and all the other required objects once that is done it waits for 20 minutes initially to make sure that the api is up so this is your temporary api and this api uh, comes up uh, it 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 waits for 40 minutes but you can see that within 30 or within 10 10 to 12 minutes we had this um, api up or, or the bootstrap status completing that means uh, the the timeout value is kept more but before that the installation itself or the installer is so fast enough to make sure that the the experience of installation becomes more and more easier once the bootstrap is completed as i said this is a temporary bootstrap uh, we just use them to make our production environment up and running that is exactly where once this is done the the resources of this are de destroyed so we do not keep any stale resources as well on aws or any of the other cloud providers we use and these get deleted and once it's deleted the actual control plane comes up so this control plane now is with the help of the operator framework, which is a wrapper around OpenShift or over, over OKD, uh, tries to bring the other uh, required objects on uh, open or on, on. So once that is done, it says that the cluster is initialized and uh, it's, it's just waiting for getting the console uh, created. And I think it doesn't take much time. It, it just, just says that, okay, I see that there is a console there uh, there is the namespace and i also see the other objects available so that way everything is created and this is where your install is completed so at this point you get the access to um, use oc commands from the command line or also you get an access to even uh, fetch your console using the uh, using this link and also the username password in here so this definitely marks that your OKD is up and running and you can see that uh, over here, let's say if I just log out and just show you how it works. So once I, I get the installation there, I see this page where it says me or where it says that, okay, welcome to OKD. And this is the platform where you can uh, log in to, to or, or where you can uh, just, just use the credentials provided in the previous, um, in, in, in the previous uh, slide or not slide, or maybe the, on, on the command, just use it to install or, or log in to the console. So I'm just taking that uh, username and let me just take the password as well for it. So just a second. To uh, my password, yeah, that's, that's the password. Um, I just copied, and that is our login. So uh, this way, I I should be able to to access the uh, the, the console as well, and also uh, use it to to run some uh, other. Um, uh, applications, workloads, or just check how the console looks like. So as of now, I just use the cluster admin uh, access, which is created for me with installation. This can be removed once you have the other uh, um, authentication mediums attached as a day two operations. So this way you can see, I, I, I have a complete environment here. It says I have five nodes. I have these many pods. I don't have any storage classes of now. The utilization is quite good. Some uh, some uh, activities, some alerts. It says I have some of the other control pin which is down, but then that that's exactly what I was saying uh, for our orchestrator tool. It tries and brings itself up and running very fast. So to see what exactly it's getting created, you can see the settings which shows that I have uh, currently this build and uh, these are the operators which are which are governing the, the the cluster, making sure that the cluster is up and running for the long time. So these are different operators. You will also see where, and you don't have to do anything to get this up. It just gets installed by its own as per a process of installation. So this is exactly how you can see the different projects and the, the complete overview to, 
to the to the environment you just created on uh, using the OKD. So I just navigated to developer mode, and um, you can see I have a topology. I can just click on any of the project. Let's say I have this project, and I see there I have three pods. And if you want whatever you want to see, if you can just select it over here. It will show you. Just click on those. You will see the details of the pods. I have three pods running. Uh, these are the details about this pod. It's under this namespace. These are the labels. These are selectors. If there are any annotations, you can see them. You can edit them. So this way, the developer can, has the access to even um, go more ahead and see what exactly is on open or on on this OKD. You can see the uh, consumption as well, the utilization of these pods and uh, if you want to even navigate to monitoring dashboard it takes you to some other console and you can definitely see what exactly is the utilization of these containers so so this is how the complete okd uh, is 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 done and um, you should you should be able to um, you should be able to use the the same formats to install so that it becomes more and more easier Coming to the autoscaler part, because uh, since we are now uh, open and now we know how to uh, install OKD, it's very important to even install uh, or, or or even have a, a, a working um, OKD or sorry, a working Selenium grid running over it. So let me just just run through these steps to 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 make sure that we we have this uh, Selenium or a uh, we have we have been using selenium here which is a combination of zelando plus selenium uh, to make sure that dynamic scaling as and when the test test requests goes up and uh, goes or, or goes beyond the the replicas we have so let me just use the uh, terminal please I, I hope you can see my uh, screen and the terminal so this is my okd um, you can see uh, I have five nodes. Let me just make it a bit big, and uh, I'm just I'm just trying to use these commands to to run uh, Selenium over here. So I just have the repo. Yeah, I do have the repo here. After that, I'm just going to create a new project. So OC new project um, Selenium S E L E N I U M Selenium demo. So it's just it's just a command uh, like it's just one command uh, run which gets a complete project for you. I'm using the CLI. You can definitely use the UI. That is also something which is very easier and more uh, recommended to be used uh, while develop while developing. The only reason of using CLI is I'm going to use Helm uh, commands, which uh, would be a bit difficult for me to run from the uh, uh, from the uh, UI. So that's exactly why I'm I'm, I'm using uh, this. So once I have this and uh, project, I'm I'm going to use Helm to 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 run the repos and and to even get my um, templates up and running. So let me just try and see what I have. So Helm repo list. Okay, I do see that I have a Selenium uh, repo here. Well, it doesn't uh, take much time to just add them. So this is exactly what the command you have to run. Helm Rambo add, uh, just give it a name and give the link of your uh, GitHub uh, project uh, so that the, the, the charts which you have created gets loaded over here. So once this is there, you just have to run Helm uh, repo update so that you get uh, updated um, all the updated details or whatever changes you made in the charts uh, into your um, repositories, which are which are hosted over here. You can see uh, we have some stable local. I have a local repo as well on my host uh, on this current batch and host. And then I haven't have just added this Selenium uh, as well. So coming to the next part, as I just added the repo and I just have to create a template. So, or, or or using the template, I just have to create the the complete Selenium to just um, run uh, in my environment, so that I get the complete um, scalable uh, Selenium uh, grid. And that is exactly where I will just use this uh, template command. So, Helm template hyphen hyphen name Selenium. This is something which I 
taken from um, uh, the, the commands you see from the uh, presentation. And I am using charts which are available in this uh, repo or under this uh, uh, under the repo which we have just added. And this way, I am going to use a namespace which I just created, which is uh, hyphen hyphen namespace, and that was Selenium N I U M demo. So it will just say that it has created the service accounts, it has created the service for me, it has created. A deployment and some RBACs which are required to make sure that only authorized users are able to access it. So let me navigate to the project, OC project Selenium demo, and then OC get pods. I should be able to see that, okay, I have a Selenium hub over here. Let me just run the logs and you should see that this is a Selenium hub. As you can see, this hub is up and running. And then you have uh, nodes which can register uh, using this URL. When you have clients, the, the clients come to this URL. And it says that, okay, the hub is started and the testing and all is all enabled. You should be able to use Selenium now. And it also says that it has currently added two hosts, like the two nodes. So just to see get ports and you should see that we have two, uh, two nodes as well. So just coming back to our UI, in the UI as well, you can even see over here, if I navigate to the project Selenium demo, you should be able to see that I have one pod and the, the same pod I have uh, the, the, the hub running uh, very well. And if not this way, you can just go to the admin page. Uh, let's say if you have that access, and just navigate to networking and just to the routes. This will show you that there are some routes created. Now, uh, since we just have a service and have not created any route, you can just go ahead and click on create. Just give it a name. This is a uh, hub URL and the host name will be picked. Uh, we don't have to do it. I will just use the Selenium grid. This is what I want to use as support. If you have, we want to secure it, just use the TLS uh, and just secure them. If not, just hit create and that's exactly what the hub URL looks like. So just click on the hub URL and you should see the hub running. If I navigate to console, I see that I have one a node here and one node over here. So that's pretty much how you get the complete uh, auto scalable uh, Selenium infra. And this infra is now ready so that it can go ahead and run some tests on it. So that was all around the demo of how to install and uh, bring up the Selenium grid. I will now give it up to, or I'll, I'll give it to Deepak so that he can run through the tests and uh, show how exactly the the testing uh, helps or how exactly the, the resources get scaled when the tests are run. So over to you, Deepak. Thank you, Jatin. I'll share my screen. Can you, can you all see my screen? Not yet, but yeah, hopefully it's so people to see it. Never mind. Can you can you share your screen yet and again with the uh yeah. Zelenium grid console? This one. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what the console looks like. Okay, so I have uh, I have Selenium tests written in Java uh, with TestNG as the runner, and uh, I I have four tests in each class which I want to run parallelly on uh, both Firefox and Chrome. So what I'll do now is uh, I'll start my run, and you'll see that right now we just have one uh, one instance of the Selenium node running, and as soon as I start my test, I will see that there would be some auto scaling. And here we go. I have started the run, and I'll ask uh, Jatan to uh, refresh the page and show you whether we are actually increasing the uh, nodes. So the test run is going right now. 
So you can see that two requests are waiting for slot to be free. And it will now, uh, in a moment, create another replica of this uh, Zelenium node. Here you go. So this is totally uh, uh, auto scalable depending on uh, depending on certain hub parameters like max instances per session, your new instance timeout. We recommend you keep the new instance timeout to equal to uh, equal to what your hub or your test timeout is, so that uh, you, your tests don't fail without any uh, reason. So as Jatan said, we use Selenium because uh, the actual Selenium grid, the official uh, Selenium grid project has some issues with auto scaling. So Selenium itself is, uh, you can think of Selenium as the uh, Selenium grid on steroids. It has some inbuilt uh, VNC capabilities as well. Let's say you want to view what's actually going on in your test so you can open the debug mode and actually see the it also retains your videos for some time uh, apart from that uh, the actual selenium project is also going to merge with the official selenium project uh, after release 4 so it's uh, i think it's okay if you use selenium as well so as you saw uh, the test run is complete uh, we uh, based on because i had a uh, parallel test so it raised the selenium instances to two and then automatically uh, came back to one instance again so you can uh, the the thing which we are trying to achieve is that historically the setting up of uh, end to end test automation infrastructure has been a pain point for test automation developers always so as i said they uh, they some of them use their local host to run the selenium test some of have this painful setup of vms and some of them use uh, docker containers locally or on vms so this gives you some enterprise level Sel selenium cloud where the your test engineers only focus on creating the tests and not on the infrastructure. So uh, you you get you get as uh, Jatan uh, created this uh, route. So you get one route which can serve all your end-to-end uh, -end testing needs. I mean browser testing needs. So this is pretty much uh, about. Uh, back to you, Jatan, if you want to add something. Yeah, so this is pretty much how um, you can achieve those dynamic scalings as per whatever tests you run. Since we just had to move from one to two, you can see that uh, initially we had um, one uh, hub and one uh, node. So if, if I just click on one of them, that one would be your uh, hub on which uh, you have the, 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 the complete Selenium hub running and the URL for this is over here. You can see the see the console, or you can just see this is how the 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 the, the, the UI looks like. If I, I guess if I just append it with WD hyphen hub, it will just show me some more details around the hub as well. So that is exactly how uh, you 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 run some command, or you run these uh, URL to 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 let the test uh, know that this is where the the selenium is. And uh, with the help of the orchestrator tool, uh, the, the requests are reaching your hub. And as per whatever configurations are there on the hub, it's been shared with your uh, underlying nodes. So that is where the tests are also helping. And you do not have to set up any environments by yourself. You just have to create once and uh, just set up the right values as Deepak mentioned. I'll just show you that those as well. So you just click on the deployments and we have some environment variables which says that, okay, this is the request. These are some limits which should be always catered to so that the node doesn't go down. These are some max numbers which we have set. And as he said that um, this is the, the sessions we have enabled. And even it should be that uh, visible that let's say if there is no instances to, to address any of the tests, it doesn't just say that, okay, just give an error. It, waits for the mentioned time and then 
once it's uh, it's it's available, it's it's been shared by the other tests. So that way, the tests are also running. It's getting auto scaled, and you are able to get all the results based on this uh, container grid or based on the complete container grid. So I think that is pretty much what we had in the demo. I guess if there are any questions, please uh, raise those to us, and we are here to help you on with it. So anything, uh, Deepak, you would like to add in, please go ahead. No, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, as Jatin mentioned, uh, uh, if uh, if you don't know Hub and uh, Selenium Hub and Node, uh, which actually comprises the Selenium grid, was designed in a way to where the Hub acts as a delegator. It receives the requests from multiple clients or one client sending parallel testing requests and then delegates those tests to uh, multiple browsers, which it has uh, controlled as part of uh, its strategy with multiple uh, pa customizable parameters, like uh, it has four Chrome nodes and two Firefox nodes and maybe an Opera node and stuff like that. So that's what Hub is all about. But uh, with, with an orchestrator tool, you just uh, take it to the enterprise level where your test engineers don't worry about uh, where to run your test. It, it just it just one URL and uh, always up and scales automatically. Perfect. So that's it from our side. Uh, thank you so much for being the patient and uh, taking a look at this. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for attending this session and my gratitude towards Jatan and Deepak for presenting this session out very well. This was quite interesting session. I think yeah, people loved the session and I see a couple of questions or like people, if you do have any of the questions, you can just post over the chat box right to your uh, right side of your screen so that the speaker, like we have both of the speakers available to answer all of your questions here. So go ahead. Let me jump in. And I think we don't have any more questions. I see on the chat box. So yeah, once again, thanks, Jatin. Uh, and thanks, Deepak, for the amazing session. 